The toughest thing about writing music for film and television is it has to be done in a certain amount of time. So the evolution of the template has just grown exponentially. Every choice that I make with my template and with my writing process is always based on trying to gain back little chunks of speed. My orchestra in my template is always on standby. It's always loaded. It's always ready to go. You know, when I first got into this business, it was all about notes and, and music and harmony and counterpoint. And it was all about the music. And then, you know, kind of as you come into this business and you realize how technical film scoring is and, and how much of it is geared um, on time, you know, you, you, need, you need to be able to, the toughest thing about writing music for film and television is it has to be done in a certain amount of time. You know, when, when Beethoven wrote a symphony, he wasn't under time constraints to, to finish that symphony in a certain amount of time. Um, but when we write film scores, there's, there's, a, there's a, a time limit that we're given to do it. And, and, most of the, and, and as the history of film scoring has gone on, that time limit has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk because of technology. So after I was done learning about all then, you're never really fully done, but after I was done studying counterpoint and harmony and, and all the things, um, that I needed to learn when I was younger and in music school, um, I came out to LA and started working in film scoring and realized that I, I pretty much only learned 10% of what I needed to learn. And then, be, then it all became about this. It all became about this, the technology, the sequencer, um, and basically how to utilize all this. When I was coming into film scoring, it was this stuff was just starting to come on the scene. We were getting away from acoustic instruments and starting to do, you know, the mock-up was becoming uh, an integral part of the, of the job. Um, and with that became a whole new style of writing music. Um, we got away from paper and pencil and we started, this became our paper and pencil. And this is kind of um, the world that we started writing in. And, and as that happened, the the, the evolution of the process was changing from year to from actually from month to month to year to year um, because the software was developing so fast. Um, the 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 technique for using it was constantly always changing, and and over the years that I that I've been doing this, um, I have refined and refined and have refined the way that I use samples and the way, and, it, and it brings me now to talking about the template and and how important um, the template has become to film scoring. Um, there's a couple different philosophies. Um, when I first started off um, in this business, um, I, I I really wanted to set up my template so it mimicked what an orchestra looked like on paper. Um, as the sample li libraries have became more and more um, involved and um, and in depth with the amount of articulations that they were covering, and when we first started off, it was, you know, violins long and violin shorts, violas long, viola shorts, French horn long, French horn shorts. That was it. You know, you had shorts and longs. Um, every now and then they would have a little one shot of a run or an orc effect or, or something of that nature. But um, where, from, from where we started and where we are today, I mean, you know, just as an example, let me just show you all these tracks right here in yellow are my brass. And you can see it's just, here's the first horn. You know, first horn alone, maybe there's, you know, 12, 13, 15 articulations just for the first horn. Second horn, same amount of articulations. So probably within these first two horn patches, I probably have as many samples as when I started, when I first started in this for the whole entire orchestra. So the evolution of the template has just grown exponentially in size. I mean, it's huge. You know, if I scrolled all the way from the top, you know, these, these instruments right here in the gray are my woodwinds. Um, some of these instruments up top here are different effects and since kind of go-to sense that I always go to. But my orchestra in my template 
is always on standby. It's always loaded. It's always ready to go starting. And I still, the way that I organize it, I still organize it in orchestral order. Um, like it was on a score, you know, I start off with, with my, you know, my woodwinds up top with, you know, flutes, um, you know, in, in this template right here, I have, I have three flutes plus a piccolo, go to my oboes, then I go to my clarinets, then I go to my bassoons, but you can see how many articulations, it's just everything here in gray um, are, are woodwinds and I'm scrolling and scrolling. So it's, you know, you're looking at five, 600 tracks. Um, just to cover the orchestra and to cover the articulations. Now, in order to load that many articulations, um, there's a couple systems. You know, I used to use a system that was based on a bunch of slave computers. Um, and every, every choice that I make with my template and with my writing process is always based on trying to gain back little chunks of speed. Um, the slave system was fantastic. I ran a I ran a program by VSL um, called VN Ensemble Pro, and it and actually, if I go back even further, I used to use a program called Giga Studio, um, and you could load. You know, I forgot what the amount of RAM was. You know, you could load. I think it was like sixty four. It was all it was all sample dependent. It's it's actually been so long since I've used Giga Studio that I I can't even. I don't even think Giga Studio is not even being developed anymore, and it's been out of business for a while. Um, but it was it was um it was you know it was a way to basically offload samples onto slave computers. It was it was one of the first systems. Before that, we had hardware samplers. Um, but when I was coming into this business, the hardware samplers were kind of going, you know, dis uh, extinct, and software sampling was becoming um, was coming on the scene. And Giga Studio really was the the father of kind of software sampling and and, and brought it into this world. Um, but as we, uh, as as kind of time's gone on, that was the initial idea. I would have a bunch of other computers. I think I used to organize it. I would have a computer for woodwinds. I'd have a computer for brass. I'd have a computer for strings, and then I would have usually a computer for percussion, and then everything else I would try to handle in the box. So I had these four other computers that were off in the machine room working away and loading all these samples. The problem with it was one computer would go down. And my woodwinds wouldn't be working anymore. So then I would have to get up, go into the control room, restart the computer, shut down my sequencer, reboot up the computer again, load in, you know, 200, you know, a, a bunch of different samples on the computers, and it would eat away time at my day. It would slow down my writing process and slow down my creative process. Um, so at, at first, it was, it was the only choice I had was to be able to use those slave computers because the single computer wasn't, you weren't able to have as much RAM you needed in one single computer and during that time um, to load in a template of this size. And every year the temple would grow and then you would have to buy more slave computers and it just became this ongoing thing. Luckily, the technology moves faster than the, you know, the, the process of, of sample development um, just by nature. The technology, computer technology seems to move faster than anything. And in a good way, we're kind of playing catch up with it. Um, so as time went on and as these computers became stronger and stronger and stronger, the processors became stronger and stronger processors could handle more RAM. And therefore, we're finally at a point where I could use a computer and load as much RAM as I needed into it to cover the complete load of my template. So what that made it was, so what became possible then, and this is just very recently, I, um, HP is a great computer company. I realized that they uh, had a line of computers called the Z series. Um, and I was able to load up to two terabytes of RAM into a computer. Not that I would ever need that much. And I don't think when HP made these computers, they weren't necessarily thinking of them. You know, they, they needed, obviously, a, it was obviously a computer being built to be able to calculate a really high floating point data. And, and they needed to have very strong and robust processors. They're workstation class computers. They aren't, you know, home computers. They're, they're a very uh, powerful machine. So um, when I first started, uh, when I was in this search to try to find these computers to be able to load all this RAM and so I could get rid of the slave computers, they were the first company that I kind of researched and, and came up with a computer there where I could load more than, you know, 128 gigs of, of RAM into them. I could load up to, like I said, up to two terabytes at a price. <laughs> the RAM ended up costing three times more than the computer did. Yeah. Um, but I was able to do it. And what that allowed me to do now was to have one computer 
with all of my tracks into it, all loaded into RAM, all ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, therefore, what happened was I was able to get rid of all the slave computers, and now I just have one computer, and it has everything loaded into it that I need to have loaded into it. Um, so basically what that allowed me to do now was to take this whole entire template that used to be spread out across a bunch of different computers, and I was able to load them in um, to my sequencer that I'm using, which is Cubase, um, and I was able to have all of these tracks loaded internally into the system. Um, so now I have my whole entire template loaded into my system and it's all ready to go kind of at a moment's notice. The other thing that that allowed me to do that I never was able to do before was I was allowed to be able to treat each one of these tracks as a separate track. So instead of grouping all of these tracks into a high string track or to a violin bus and have all my shorts and my longs and everything going into a bus, now I have complete control. And if I wanted to put a huge reverb on my high string harmonics to give it a very dreamy sound, I could just do that only on the high string harmonics now. And I, it's not gonna affect my violin longs. It's not gonna affect um, any of my shorts. It's just gonna affect literally that one high string harmonic, that violin harmonic track. So it gives me a ton of flexibility when it comes to um, manipulation of different sounds. You know, I'm looking here, oh, you know, I have a, a children's choir legato. I wanna put them into a giant cathedral, but then I have some men's short, you know, choir that I want to have very little reverb on them because I want them to really, you know, punch and have them be present in the mix. It allows me to use different EQs on things. I could never do that before when I was running slave computers because I would need so many inputs if I wanted to do that. I would need a, you know, four or 500 input system to try to get the separation on all those tracks. So by being internal like that, it started to give me a lot of flexibility to be able to manipulate um, the different tracks. And with film scoring, where we are now with film scoring, the, the orchestra, there's, there's obviously some projects that I do where it's just very organic and, and a very orchestral sound, but where we are today with movies and with films and with shows and video games, um, the orchestra has just become you know, one color in a score. It's not the color of a score. It's, 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 I almost look at the orchestra as just another instrument in the soundtrack. Um, even if it is 90 instruments, I still think of it as kind of one tool to use when I'm, when I'm creating a score. Um, and that tool now can be manipulated in a lot of different ways um, because I'm also of the mindset where I don't throw on my samples at the end of a project. It's not like I, you know, get all my samples, uh, you know, uh, I take. I don't just take my mock-up and replace it and, and just get rid of it. If the mock-up is good and I really enjoy the way that it sounds and it has a specific color to it, I will keep it in the recording and use it with the live stuff. Um, I think there's a there's a. Um, I think it's important to the the sample development has has gotten so good with the recordings and with. Um, and I can bring in a lot of directors to attest to that too. I mean, there's a lot of directors that fall in love with the way the sample sound. It's a, it's, it's becoming a sound, just like the sound of the orchestra, um, just like the sound of you know analog synths or um, you know digital synths. Just it's, it's becoming another color, um, and that's why the mock-up becomes extremely important. Um, and that's why you have to take such good care of. Um, you know, the, the template and, and, and how we control it and, and use it. So I really do like having a, a huge template like this. And I do love the fact that it's all internal because of the time that it saves. The other great thing that I like to do, though, and this is there's this is the other philosophy of it. The other, so there, that's that's kind of one one way to think of the template is you have every single instrument in your template. It's all there ready to go. Um and I love it. I mean, it's always, I talk about speed and I talk about how important it is to be, you know, quick and to be able to gain back as much of that time as you can, because like I said, we have a certain amount of time to write a film score. And, and as an example, I'm going to get up really quick, but I'll be right back in frame. This, you know, this is a, this is an example. This isn't the score that I wrote for Maze Runner, but you can see how, how much music's required to write a film score. I mean, it's a, it's a giant chunk of music. I mean, if you took you know, a symphony and you compared it to it, you know, it, it, it might, it's probably shorter than this. I mean, it's just a huge amount of music. Um, this score had to be written in, you know, four, 
maybe four or three months, you know, it's just a giant amount of music. So in order to accomplish that amount of music, um, you have a lot of people that are helping you, you know, as far as orchestrators and conductor and, you know, there's a lot of support staff. Um, but you need to be able to have the organization in order to accomplish something in that amount of time. Um, so when you really, when you put it on paper and you see how much music it is, it, it really is, you know, staggering how much of that has to be done in a, in a real short amount of time. Um, so gaining that speed, I'll keep talking about it over and over and over again, like a broken record, but you need to be able to produce a lot of music in a quick fashion and have it be decent. <laughs> um, so having everything kind of in one template is really important. The one problem, and, and this is a different philosophy, so I, I do like having that at my fingertips. The, the problem with a big template that I would always run into is that when it came to inspiration, when you have a big template like that, it's really easy to go, oh, I'm just going to click on my long strings and start you know, playing something. And you would come up with something and you're kind of there, oh, great, you know, you get it. And then I would just, you know, click on another instrument and, you know, start playing. And it's, oh, you know, that's great there. And then I start building. But it's really quick. It's really easy just to kind of go to some track in your template and just start playing something until you get inspired against picture and go that route. And some people say, oh, well, you know, that's that's great that you can do that. But the thing that I found about it, though, is it it forced me in a weird way I wouldn't think through what I wanted to do. Um, when I look at a blank template and I look at picture, it forces me to go, well, what, before I even put my hands on the keyboard, I can visually look at the picture and go, what am I going to do here? And then I would, I would have to think about what instrument I would go to um, and start writing with. But I would think about it in my head first. I would make a conscious decision of what I was going for and what I wanted to do. Um, sequences are great now because they allow us to be able to kind of have a big, a huge template, but also have the same concept of not seeing anything. You know, it's a, it's still, this is a blank page to me right now. I'm not influenced by looking at a certain patch that I like the way it plays or feels. Um, and it, it, it forces me to, uh, to make some conscious decisions on where I want to start my cue. Um, you know, with, with Cubase, um, it's nice because they have this search system. So if I'm sitting here and I'm looking at, you know, picture here and I go, okay, you know, I'm in the middle of a, uh, you know, a um, action sequence um, and I'm inspired by this frame or something, I can go, oh, you know, like I hear strings here, you know, and I can type in, you know, strings or I can type in, you know, violins. Um, let's just do this. Uh, what am I going to be? So let's say, oh, okay, great. You know, this section right here, I hear, you know, it could be something aggressive. So I'm going to open up my Met, you know, you know Metropolis strings low, low spiccatos. Um, and so now I can start building my template without looking at 600 tracks um, as, I'm, as I'm moving along. So it, even though my whole template's there, it's still ready to go. And then I say, okay, cool. I got my low strings and then I'm going to start building my ensemble. Then I'm going to look at some, some horn options here. Say, okay, cool, uh, let's do, uh, you know, the horn met nine staccato. And then I start slowly building um, my ensemble as I would on a piece of manuscript or if I was sitting at a piano. And I always have a piano loaded because that's the place kind of I always go to to start sketching things out. Um, but I have this giant monstrous template, um, even though it doesn't look like there's anything loaded right here. But if I showed every single one of my tracks... Again, we're back to the 600, 800 tracks, whatever it was. It keeps growing as we keep going talking here. Um, but it, but this allows me to control the size of that ensemble. So I literally can just keep, you know, building. Okay, here's my flute legatos. And I don't have to, and I can kind of, I'm making conscious decisions of how I want the cue to sound in my head before I'm actually just scrolling up and down through things, picking random instruments and dragging regions up and down. I'm thinking more like a composer and, and less as a programmer um, when I'm in the writing, when I'm in the initial writing phase. But as I go through the writing phase and the piece starts to come to life, the fantastic thing about this concept is now I can go into like an orchestrator phase and I can start opening up um, you know, the template in its full 
you know, glory here. And okay, let's say here's my, uh, you know, my flutes. And let's say I had like a bunch of regions here with different information. And now I can say, okay, well, here's my flutes and I want, okay, I want, you know, two flutes on this line. So I'll drag them down. Um, I use a lot of the orchestral tools predominantly for my orchestral stuff. The, the greatest thing about their stuff is you're able they've done such a great job with the with capsule and and with the articulations and they've taken you know a lot of um time and effort in making sure it's balanced recorded in the right spots all the cc information is um fluent through all the different instruments i mean you know cc1 controls the same data as it does in all the instruments so if i moved flute one down to the oboe one it's going to translate exactly and the balance is going to be right and so um, when you get into that orchestration phase now, and as I start opening on more of these tracks and I start to really drill down um, into building the track, and like, for instance, if I had a, you know, a melody line here in the flutes that I wanted to double with the horns, um, you know, I want to double the, the flutes with nine horns. <laughs> um, if I drag them down like that, it's, it's going to play, and I might have to go in here and adjust some levels. Um, but, you know, it's really nice to be able to kind of have that big tempo mentality, but at the same time, too, also feel like you're starting with a blank page and forcing yourself to think like a, a composer of, you know, 30, 40 years ago when you sat at a piano with a paper and pencil. And at least for me, I mean, I always, it was really for easy for me to kind of get into a, a phase of writing where it just became so mundane to like, having this giant template and I would get it to this point where I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about what I was writing and I was just trying to cruise along as fast as I could. Um, and I kind of got away from, from the inspiration of why I got into this in the first place. Um, but I, but you know, you have to, you really do have to be conscious though of how fast you're moving and how, and how, you know, how many minutes of music you're getting done a day. It's just, it's just, an unavoidable part of the business. Um, we just, we have to be conscious of that timeline. Um, the other great thing now with Cubase, I can, you know, after I get all my, let's say I build my tracks, I can kind of go into um, this phase now where I can, you know, go up to these, they have these, uh, I can't remember what they call them. I think they're called operators or something where I can say, okay, I just want to sheet tracks just with data. And now it shrinks down everything and I can just see now the, the tracks that just have regions on them. So again, it allows me to kind of go from, you know, big, huge template to a very concise template and, and workflow. And, and that's kind of the, you know, where we've ended up, um, you know, with, with the sequencer and, and with the template. Um, and, and again, we're just, we're literally just talking about just the orchestral side of it um, right now, but it's the same thing holds true with, with all the, you know, the hybrid elements, you know, whether it's, you know, electric percussion, which is up here. And then I have, and I, and I organize everything. I think it's important, the color coding and the organization um, of all these tracks just starts to become really important too. Cause you know, we're dealing with 600 tracks, you know? And so when they're colored all a certain way, if I have a bunch of different tracks, um, if I have a bunch of different tracks open, it allows me to kind of, um, quickly, um, scroll up and down and, you know, see where I'm doing. Oh, I know. I automatically know, you know, all the brown tracks are, are some sort of family of strings where the yellow tracks are some family of, of brass. Um, so this just allows me to, you know, quickly, um, the organization of the sequence also becomes extremely important because there, there's a whole nother side to the writing process. After we're done writing the cue, after the cue is getting, you know, it gets approved by the producers in the studio. Now I have to print the cue. And when you have to print a cue that has, I don't know, 150 to 200 different elements in it, you need to know what you're printing. So when you give it to the mixer, he's not spending his whole day organizing the track so he can mix it. Um, again, like I said, I don't throw away the mock-up. I give it to my mixer. He takes these 150 tracks and he takes the 100 tracks he has from the orchestra. And then he takes, you know, the other couple tracks that he may have from some pre-records that I did with a guitar player or a specialist, a soloist, whatever it may be. Um, 
And he's kind of mixed all that stuff. So the organization of that stuff, the labeling of it, um, it all has to be very thought through and there has to be kind of a system in place for this organization. So, you know, when we have all these tracks, uh, you know, they're all labeled. There's a labeling scheme to them. The articulation is labeled. The library is labeled. Let's say, you know, and this, this happens a lot too, uh, you, you never think about this when you're writing, but there's been time, like, you know, Maze Runner is a great example. Uh, Maze Runner was a trilogy. There's three films. The director said, oh, you know, what was that cue that you used? And, in, in, you know, I love the cue that you, 1M5 in, in Maze Runner 1. I want to I reuse that. I want to resurrect it for this one scene in, in, you know, the third Maze Runner installment, The Death Cure. Um, and I say, okay, cool. And I open up that sequence. If that sequence is a mess, if I try to resurrect that cue, because let's face it, that movie was done in 2000, I can't remember, 15 or something. We're 2018 right now. My computer's changed. My sample libraries have changed. My, um, you know, the, my template has completely radically changed. Um, my studio has changed. But I still have to resurrect this cue from 15, or from, you know, three, four years ago. If my labeling system is incorrect, I have no idea what strings I was using. I have no idea what reverb I was using. I have no idea what synth that pad, you know, if I just labeled a synth a pad, I don't know what library that was from. And now the director's going, I want that cue again. And, you know, and, but we have to manipulate the cue. It's like we can just grab the old stems from the old cue and throw them in there. Um, I want to be able to open that sequence, look at everything. Even if all the instruments don't load, I want to be able to know what library it was, what articulation it was, what the name of the pad was. Um, you know, and, and that becomes extremely important um, when it comes to writing music for media. There's this recall that you need to be able to, um, you know, get to as close as possible as you possibly can. Sometimes you aren't able to get every single, you know, aspect of the, you know, whether it's, you have some crazy automation on it or something, you know, it's, you might lose something, but you need to be able to have a system in place that allows you to recall as much as you, it's something that you need to think about. Um, when I first started off with all this stuff, I would just kind of write in a sequence. And then over time, I found myself in these situations where I needed to recall an old cue or, you know, I started off in, um, you know, or you're doing, you know, a bunch of different versions of a cue. And y y if you don't have organization, um, it's quickly going to start to unravel on, the, on you. Um, so I'm, I'm, when it comes to the organization of the template too, not just the concept of it, but when it comes to the organization, the labeling, um, how you're bussing things, um, you know, different folder structures, um, you know, in my thing, I have, uh, you know, I'll have a, 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 the main folder called Brass. And then within that folder, I have different libraries nested in it. Metropolis 1 Brass, Metropolis 2 Brass. And then in these library, in these folders, I have the articulations for that library. So it's very, it's, I organize everything of mine based on sample libraries. So if a sample library comes out, I don't just lay, I just don't put all the horns in the horn folder. I actually drill down even further than that. I, I, I do it. And, and because everything is so organized by sample libraries, it kind of a little, like when I know, when I go to Metropolis One Brass, I know that there's a certain, Control structure with capsule, for instance, that CC1 controls this, you know, um, you know, CC11 controls this and in, in, in the orchestral tool stuff. But if I want to use a patch from Spitfire, for instance, I know if I drag that Metropolis 1 brass section down into a Spitfire um, library, I know that I'm going to have to manipulate it a little bit because they have a different set of, of um, articulation. So by organizing everything by sample library as well within the template, it immediately lets me know how much work it's going to take um, in order for me to translate that line from the Metropolis stuff into, for instance, a, a Spitfire library. So I like to organize because all these libraries have their own strengths. So I like to, I like to organize my stuff um, in that type of structure where it's, it's really dependent on the, on the sample library as well. Um, so again, all this stuff has been tried and tested throughout the last, you know, 15, 16 years for me. So it's been a, um, a kind of, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've tested it a lot. And, um, 
there's no really one way to do it. I mean, this way works really well for me, but for another composer, maybe they just don't like having a template all template at all. Um, some guys even have more elaborate setups than this. Um, I always feel like I never stop working my template. It's like, and I always say to people, the sequencer is my musical instrument. This is what I play. People, I have friends who, who play in bands and they're always like, oh, you should you know, come and play with us one night. And I'm always like, if you have a sequencer there, I'll be more than happy to be there and play with you guys. <laughs> but but I, this is my instrument now. For some people, it's piano. Some people, it's a violin. For me, it's, it's the sequencer. Um, and I never really stop trying to figure out ways that I can manipulate it to you know, help me um, get through things as quick as I can. Um, with scoring because uh, it's the way that I write film music. It's the way that um, I'm inspired by things. It, it, it truly is the center of my universe when it comes to writing music for film and TV.